Major breaking news, the Second Amendment advocates, the Second Amendment attorneys have filed a major brief opposing the state of Illinois' position that the Illinois quote-unquote assault weapon ban, banning semi-automatic firearms and magazines that hold more than 10 rounds, is unconstitutional. Specifically, the state is trying to defend their law. The Second Amendment lawyers are trying to say that the law violates the Second Amendment, which in my view undeniably does. But let's break it all down because there's a lot to talk about, which we will in one second. Hey folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of the Four Boxes Diner, proud American gun owner, constitutional attorney, member of the United States Supreme Court Bar, and author of Israel Disarmed, What the 10-7 Attacks on Israel Teach Americans About the Right to Bear Arms. We must always learn from the mistakes of others, and I explain that in great detail in Israel Disarmed. All right, folks, so major news here. A couple days ago, I did a video explaining how the state of Illinois submitted over 3,000 pages of documents to try to justify their quote-unquote assault weapon ban, which is really just a ban on ordinary semi-automatic firearms and magazines that hold more than 10 rounds or so under Illinois law. But now the Second Amendment forces, the Second Amendment lawyers, and their parties that they represent have submitted a major opposition arguing that indeed... Indeed, the Second Amendment has been violated by the state of Illinois and by Governor Pritzker. These arguments are playing out in front of Judge Stephen McGlynn, Judge Stephen McGlynn, who is the judge in the United States District Court for the Southern District of Illinois. As you may recall, Judge McGlynn originally found that this law violated the Second Amendment and entered a preliminary injunction. That injunction went up to the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, along with several other cases. And in a two-to-one decision, in a case that is generally called Bevis versus Naperville, but in my opinion, it should be more properly called the Beavis and Butthead case because of the decision that was made and the absurdity of the ruling by the two judges in the majority, two judges who we've discussed before are very bitter, in my opinion, because they never got elevated to the U.S. Supreme Court. That's Diane Wood, who wrote the opinion, and Judge Frank Easterbrook who sided with her against the dissent of Trump-appointed judge Michael Brennan. Two-to-one decision, and as I've explained before, the Beavis and Butthead decision, sometimes referred to as the Bevis versus Naperville decision, got it totally wrong. Specifically, where the Seventh Circuit got wrong, and the reason why this is so important, is because the Seventh Circuit set forth the law it thinks covers the Second Amendment, which even though it's totally wrong in my view, And I suspect if Judge McGlynn were here, he would agree with me. We'll see what he does with his opinion, how he rules what he says. Nevertheless, the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeal said on a preliminary preliminary basis, they refused to allow the preliminary injunction in favor of the gun owners of America, the gun owners of Illinois, to be withstood, to to be upheld. And instead, they allowed the law to go into effect. They remanded the case back down to Judge McGlynn who's just held a trial and allowed for these post-trial submissions to occur. Keep in, mind, this is a, keep in mind, this is a trial that occurred before Judge McGlynn. He's the one who's going to make the decisions on the findings of fact and the conclusions of law. There was no jury here. This is a bench trial. We'll see what Judge McGlynn does. Now, again, the law as set forth in the Seventh Circuit by virtue of this two-to-one decision in the Beavis and Butthead opinion, also known as Bevis, They got this entirely wrong. How so? To begin with, the two-to-one decision, rather than simply applying the in-common use test set forth by Heller, played a lot of games. The first thing they did is they refused to simply define what an arm is as, as a matter of text of the Second Amendment. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Rather than simply applying the definition of arms as set forth by the U.S. Supreme Court in Heller and beyond, which is simply anything that can be used offensively or defensively. No, what this panel did, at least the two judges of the majority, Judge Easterbrook and Judge Wood did, is they went on to say that the Second Amendment plaintiffs bear the burden to show that these weapons, these arms, are not something that the military could use. Specifically, here is what the Beavis and Butthead said by the Seventh Circuit on this point. The Seventh Circuit wrote as follows, quote, Summarizing, the Supreme Court said that the Second Amendment extends prima facie to all instruments that constitute bearable arms. But what exactly falls within the scope of bearable arms? 
not machine guns, the Supreme Court said, because they can be dedicated exclusively to military use. Yet a normal person can certainly pick up and carry a machine gun, or for that matter, the portable nuclear weapons we mentioned at the outset. Bearable thus must mean something more than transportable or capable of being held. Oh, that's just stupid. Just stupid. Because again, the Supreme Court has defined the right of the people to keep their arms Define the term arms as anything that can be used offensively or defensively. And even if you throw on the adjective or the phrase bearable, as in bearable arms, BFD, bearable just means you can carry them, right? So at a textual level, at a textual level, yes, machine guns are arms. Yes, knives are arms. Yes, semi-automatic rifles are arms. Yes, anything that can be used offensively or defensively is an arm. Textually, yes, that is correct. It's as simple as that. But the Seventh Circuit tried to create the extra burden. And why is that? Because we've talked about this before. At the textual level of the text first, burn shifts to the government. For the government then has to show a historical tradition of regulation going back to the founding. The burden is upon the Second Amendment plaintiff, arguably, at the textual level. So what happens is the anti-gun judges and the anti-gun lawyers try to force every conceivable Second Amendment-related issue into the text. Because once the text is satisfied, the burden shifts to the government. So the government doesn't want any part of a Second Amendment analysis to ever be at the historical level because the government doesn't want to bear the burden because in most instances they can't satisfy it. So therefore they try to shove the burden onto the Second Amendment, pro-Second Amendment plaintiffs and their lawyers at the textual level, which is exactly what the Seventh Circuit did in their Beavis and Butthead opinion. That now... Rightly or wrongly, the lawyers and Judge McGlynn have to satisfy or address because the Seventh Circuit is the superior court to the district court, Judge McGlynn. But it shouldn't matter here because I think the Second Amendment advocates have the better argument. But just so you understand what we're fighting up against, it's nonsense law that's inconsistent with the Second Amendment and inconsistent with what the Supreme Court has said about it. Nevertheless, Judge Easterbrook and Judge Wood got around a Supreme Court review by basically saying that they're open to suggestions. This is only a preliminary analysis. They're willing to hear more evidence after there's a full-blown trial. And that is what Judge McGlynn has now just provided. And we'll see what he does. So again, just so you understand what the Seventh Circuit did, and then I'm going to talk about how the Second Amendment lawyers in this powerful brief have, I think, satisfied the issue of the Seventh Circuit, is they said textually, if an arm is exclusively military, it can be banned. Then they also say at the historical level that if a weapon is exclusively military, it can be banned. But then they put a very powerful footnote, which is very helpful to the Second Amendment community, that says if a weapon, and by the way, remember what I'm saying here. This is not actually the law of America. This is not actually the law of the Supreme Court. It is not actually the law of the Supreme Court, America, or the Second Amendment. It's not. But this is the law right now in the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals that is binding on Judge McGlynn. So keep that in mind as I explain this to you. So again, what the Seventh Circuit did say is if a weapon has a mixed use, a mixed use, which means the civilians have a you know, need or use for it, as well as the military, then it can't be banned. That's this standard. None of this is based in law. This is just made up by the Seventh Circuit two to one decision in Beavis versus Butthead, also known as Bevis. Now, just so you understand the standard that the Bevis court set out, here is what they write, and then I'm going to show you the exception, and then I'm going to explain to you what the Second Amendment lawyers and their parties, the parties and their lawyers, have done to satisfy this. This is what the Seventh Circuit said in Bevis about the standard that has to be met, supposedly, by the Second Amendment supporters. The Second Amendment plaintiffs in each of the cases before us thus have the burden of showing that the weapons addressed in the pertinent legislation are arms, are arms that ordinary people would keep at home for purposes of self-defense, not weapons that are exclusively or predominantly useful in military service or weapons that are not possessed for lawful purposes. Now, again, this is a standard that's just made up. But the good news is, even though this is the wrong standard, they go on to basically really point something out. They say, well, again, if an arm like a 9 millimeter or a 1911 firearm or any of these, these handguns, um, if there's a dual purpose, then they're protected under the Second Amendment. Here's also what the Bevis Court writes. The Seventh Circuit wrote, quote, Obviously, many weapons are dual use. 
Private parties have a constitutionally protected right to keep and bear them, and the military provides them to its forces. In this sense, there is a thumb on the scale in favor of the Second Amendment protection. When we refer to military weapons here, in this opinion, we mean weapons that may be essentially reserved to the military. Okay, so that's the standard. If a weapon is exclusively reserved to military use, it's not protected under the Second Amendment. That's not the law, but let's, for the sake of argument, because I think Judge McGlynn has to follow this decision of Bevis uh, in his case of Barnett versus Rao, which is the name of the case in front of him. He basically is going to take a look at the evidence proffered by the parties, and I think there's very strong evidence that the Second Amendment people are going to win. Why do I say that? First of all, it, it seems based on the record that it's pretty clear that no army in the world, no military in the world, issues to their infantry weapons that are solely saw semi-automatic rifles. In other words, if they issue rifles to their infantry, those are always at a minimum select fire, where you can fire semi-automatic as well as fully automatic. And a key component to what is military is fully automatic. This is sort of recognized by the U.S. Supreme Court historically going all the way back to at least 1994 in the Staples versus the United States case dealing with automatic firearms on how they basically can be restricted as NFA items, but semi-automatic firearms are commonly used and cannot be. Beyond that, the other thing is it's pretty clear based on this record, as well we understand, it's just by living life in America, the semi-automatic firearms are ubiquitous, right? They're everywhere. They have, you, you know, semi-automatic pistols are everywhere. That's what the Supreme Court recognized in Heller by saying they're in common use and cannot be banned. So too are semi-automatic rifles. There's tens of millions of these semi-automatic rifles in the United States. And remember how I explained to you, it's very important to talk about semi-automatic rifles and not modern sporting rifles. And why is that? Because in Heller, in Heller in 2008, the Supreme Court said that semi-automatic pistols, along with revolvers, obviously, handguns are protected because they're in common use. Modern handguns are protected because they're in common use. This is in 2008. And what was the most popular handgun that existed in 2008? The answer is semi-automatic pistols. And again, as we know, in 2011, in his dissenting opinion in the Heller 2 case in the Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, Judge, now Justice Brett Kavanaugh, points out that you cannot, you cannot basically ban semi-automatic rifles, which is what D.C. did in 2011, when the Supreme Court in 2008 has already said that semi-automatic handguns cannot be banned. How can you say semi-automatic handguns are protected arms under the Second Amendment, but not also say the semi-automatic rifles are also protected, which is exactly the point that not only have I been making, but Judge and now Justice Brett Kavanaugh made in 2011 in the Heller 2 case in his dissent. So again, that's why I want you to use the phrase semi-automatic rifle and not anything like modern sporting rifle or any of these other labels. It's not because your other labels may be right or wrong. It's because semi-automatic rifles is very not is not very malleable as a term. It's very precise. Some people pointed this out to me. And it's also what the courts use. So this is the term you should be using, semi-automatic rifle. And this is a term that is used throughout the Second Amendment brief on behalf of gun owners in the state of Illinois. They also go on to say that large capacity magazines uh, or feeding devices are also protected arms because they help improve the quality and they're essential to the functioning of semi-automatic devices because you need a magazine to make these semi-automatic rifles uh, work, obviously, semi-automatic uh, handguns work, obviously. And again, as we've talked about, if you ban a magazine that holds more than 10 rounds, and listen carefully, very important, write this down, write this down. If you ban a magazine that holds more than 10 rounds, let's say, that in and of itself is a ban on a type of firearm. That is a ban on a category of firearms. In other words, banning magazines is not just a magazine ban. It is a ban on a class or on a category of firearms. Specifically, if you ban magazines that hold more than 10 rounds, you have effectively banned an entire category of semi-automatic firearms that are capable of firing more than 10 rounds without having to be manually reloaded. So it is a firearms ban in the same way that Heller was a firearms ban on handguns. A magazine ban is a firearms ban in addition to being a magazine ban. Never lose sight of that. But beyond that, 
Uh, the Second Amendment lawyers also argue again to satisfy the Beavis versus Butthead standard, as I like to call it, this made-up standard by the Seventh Circuit. They also point out that yes, indeed, that 1911, uh, 1911, you know, 45s, uh, nine millimeters, all these kinds of pistols are routinely used by the military as well as ordinary Americans for self-defense. So this just goes to fall within that footnote that's saying that if you have uh, really a dual-use firearm that is used by both the military and civilians, then it's protected. And again, these standards are made up by the Seventh Circuit. This is not the law of the land. It is made up, and they covered their butt with the Supreme Court by saying this is a preliminary analysis. We're going to do more work after the trial, which, of course, has just occurred. So bottom line is a uh, powerful set of briefs. I will put links to these things down below in the description of this video. But again, I think there's a very strong likelihood that Judge McGlynn is going to, if I were Judge McGlynn, I think what I would do is I would say, I'm going to assess this case under the Supreme Court precedent that I think is correct and explain why the Second Amendment lawyers win, why the Second Amendment parties win. Then what I'm going to do is apply the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals uh, set of law and logic, and I'm going to show why the Second Amendment Amendment uh, parties and their lawyers prevail as well under alternative theories. That's what I would do as a district court judge. I would do it both ways. I would do it the correct way and I would do it the Bevis, Beavis versus Butthead way set forth by the Seventh Circuit. Now I want to add one additional thing. This is something I'm not sure you're aware of, but I'm going to bring it to your attention. In that two to one decision in Bevis versus Naperville, which covers all these uh, assault weapon, quote unquote, assault weapon cases in the Seventh Circuit, that two to one decision was Judge Easterbrook and Judge Wood against Judge Brennan. Judge Wood, listen carefully, Judge Wood has retired. She is no longer on the bench, which means that when an assault weapon case, an AR 15 case, a gun related case goes back up to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit on an appeal, Judge Wood, who's a terrible anti gun judge, and I think is bitter because she never made the U.S. Supreme Court. That's just my opinion. She is gone. She is off the bench. She is goodbye. She's not a senior judge. She's gone. Which means that even if they reassign uh, the same panel of Easterbrook, Brennan, and Wood to the next quote-unquote assault weapon ban case, there will be no Judge Wood. Her slot will be taken up by somebody else. Now, will that person be more loyal to the Constitution and Supreme Court precedent than Judge Wood? It can't be worse, in my opinion. It might be dramatically better. And that two-to-one decision against the Second Amendment may flip to a two-to-one decision with Judge Easterbrook in the dissent, depending on who that third judge is. That's assuming that they even reassign it to those same two judges with the slot being opened by Judge Wood, who is now totally off the bench. She's just going off doing something else in the law. I don't know what she's doing, but whatever Whatever she's doing, I'm glad she's no longer on the Seventh Circuit. That's good for the Second Amendment. All right, folks. Well, there you have it. Hope this wasn't too geeky for you. Make sure you follow me on X at for Boxes Downer. Make sure you subscribe uh, to this channel and like this video. And I encourage you to feel free to post it on other social media outlets because I'm not very good at that. And I appreciate you stopping on by. And we will see you again very soon, I hope, here at the Four Boxes Diner. Order is up. Table 2A.